Uh, one of my favorite Christmas carols is Joy to the World, The Lord Has Come. Uh, if I go around the room and ask you guys what your favorite Christmas carol is, you probably have one. Uh, something that resonates with you, something that is in your heart, something that you love, something that, you know, you like to sing all the time. Uh, and and, and the, the words of that song that I like is, joy to the world, the Lord is come. Then that word come is the word used when we talk about the word Advent. Uh, when Jesus came into this world as a baby, as uh, a human being, we refer to that word as th that, that, that act of coming down and being one among us as that word called Advent. And we talked about hope last weekend. We talked about how the Christmas message revolves around the concept of hope. Uh, the Advent season of coming is also to do with love as it is to do with hope. And as we spend some time talking about hope last week, I want to spend some time talking about the fundamental aspect of love and how we as a church fit into this larger scheme of how we are called to be a church that loves the communities and people around us. One of the key foundational pillars of Christianity is the incarnation of Jesus Christ. And what do I mean by that? It is the pillar that states that God became flesh. He assumed human nature and became a man in the form of Jesus Christ. Incarnation refers to God not only being the transcendent God that he is, that we know, that we serve, that we worship, but it also means that God took the shape and the form of a man in the form of Jesus Christ and was born to the Virgin Mary and came into the earth as a human being with a specific task that I will soon talk about. What we have to understand is there are religions in the world that talk about similar concepts as it pertains to their gods. For example, mythology is filled with stories of various gods of different shapes and sizes coming down and doing unthinkable things, if you have to ask me, some of which are probably inappropriate to talk about in church. But they came down to the earth. If you look at Hinduism, uh, Hinduism is a religion that is uh, it's a pantheon. It's, it, it's filled with millions of gods who also came down to earth to do different things. But when we look to the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, we read about a God coming down to be with us in the form of his son, Jesus Christ, he talks about it not just in the New Testament, but the Bible repeatedly reminds us through the Old Testament about the coming of this Messiah called Jesus Christ. They, say, they talk about the same God that we talk about in the New Testament, in the Old Testament. Now, when you read the gospel according to Matthew, if you start in chapter number one, it is a long list of names, the genealogy of Jesus. And that itself reflects back to the message that is so important for us to consider. And the message is this, that the story of Jesus was not a once in a lifetime story. The message and the life of Jesus was not something that just happened to one person out of nowhere, but there is a deeper truth to it. And Matthew in his gospel doesn't want to inundate us with a bunch of names and genealogies and, 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 and families that he wants to state. But instead, he draws a parallel between the Old Testament and the New Testament and takes us back all the way, generations and generations, back into time to show us that Jesus just didn't appear, but the Old Testament is strategically and beautifully connected to the New Testament. 
So when Matthew is talking about God coming down to be with us in the form of his son, Jesus Christ, he's talking about the same God of the Old Testament that said, I am the only God and you shall not worship any other God except me. And that's why Matthew begins with that genealogy. The Old Testament actually talks about different gods worshipped by different people. And there are various gods that we read in the Bible about. I'm not going to go over each one of them. But we talk about Baal and we talk about Dagon and Astarte. And, and I can go on and on. I have a long list over here. But in, in, the, in the Old Testament times and in the New Testament times and the world that we live in today, God is who your mind tells you God is. And I'm talking about God with a small g, of course, because the problem with these gods are they eventually die because these gods are connected to culture. And they will die with the cultures that created them. The God called Baal and the God called Dagon and all the gods of the Bible that we read about died with that particular culture because it was, it was a God that was made by that culture. But the only God that has been timeless and no matter how many generations have come and gone, he has remained and will always remain because that is the character of God. He is the constant God. He was was, he is, and he is to come. The reason I serve this God as opposed to every other God that represents every other worldview is because of this one thing that the Bible tells me about is this is constancy. That's, he is the unchanging God. The Bible reminds that to me and tells me I am the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. Things can change. Lifestyles can change. Culture can change. Priorities can change theologies may change but me I am God is what he says I will not change he will always remain God always was he always existed and even when we talk about Jesus coming down don't think that that is the moment that Jesus arrived on earth he always was but that was the moment in the New Testament that came down to earth in the form of Jesus Christ meant the first advent where God sent his only son to the earth for the, why? Because there was a mission that God sent his, sent his son on. And this mission was associated with a big offense. Now just journey with me as I go along talking about this. Jesus coming in the form of God, Jesus coming in the form of a human being was a big offense. Everyone wanted to accept him as a prophet. They were perfectly okay with that. But when Jesus looked at the people around him and said, I and the Father are one. I am God. If you see, if you see me, you see God. And the moment he said that, man, people started getting upset. The Bible says people wanted to stone him. This was an offense to everyone Jesus preached this message to. And our culture will do the same to us. They will stone us for telling them there is only one God. But yet, this one thing is central to the Christian faith. There is only one way to heaven. There's only one way to salvation, and that is through Jesus Christ. And why is this important? Because the first advent or coming was an act of love. And the second advent and the last advent, which is also the second advent, is also an act of love. Jesus didn't just come to give us hope like I preached last weekend. The Advent season of coming is also to do with love. His coming was rooted in love. If you go to John 3, 16, the 
cro- the core of the gospel that, that we read about and we learn about, the Bible says, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. In Matthew 18 and verse 1, Jesus says, for the son of man has come to save that which was lost. You've got to understand there's a thing that connects these two. God loved us so much that he gave, that he sent. The reason for the advent and the reason God sent his son and the reason Jesus left his heavenly precincts and his palatial precincts and he said, you know what? I want to come down to this world that was filled with sin and wrought in sin. The reason I want to do that is because I love you. There is no Christmas message without the concept of love unless and until we understand that this God that we serve is a loving God, is a gracious God, is a God that embraces us for who we are in our sinful condition. We will never understand what the advent truly means. The first advent was because he loved us and there is another advent coming where I talked about last week where the clouds will be open, where heavens will open where the trumpet will blow and God will send or Jesus will be riding on that horse opening it up and saying here I am I'm coming for the church that's the second advent that's the last advent and he's coming because he loves us so dearly and the Bible compares that you know why it, it why I'm saying this the Bible compares that like a bridegroom that's coming for its bride A bridegroom, back in the culture that we're talking about, back in in Jesus' culture, when we talk about the bridegroom and the groom, it's not like how we do it in our culture where the groom and the bride get dressed at separate places and and then they come together at the ceremony. And the first time the groom sees the, the bride is at the altar, right? That's not what happened before. That's not what happened in the olden days. In Jesus' time, what the bridegroom would do is what he would he would get dressed up, he would gather all his mates together he would gather his family and they will all go to the bride the bride's house and 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 he would go and fetch her and he would bring her back and he would bring her back to his house and that is exactly where the marriage would take place does that make sense So we understand this whole bride and the bridegroom thing from our American perspective. It will make utter nonsense. But when we take our perspective to what Jesus is talking about, man, the second advent is where the bridegroom is looking at the bride that is you and me, that is his church, that is all of us. And he's saying, I'm not coming till your your, your dress is on and when your makeup is on and when you're ready to go, when you're blameless and when you're, when you say, I'm ready for this big day, that is when Jesus, the bridegroom, will say, I'm going to come to where you are, and where you are is here. And that second advent is Jesus coming back. And you know why? Because of love. He says, I'm coming back to get you, and there is a marriage that's going to take place. That's what the Bible talks about. But why would he love? Because we were lost and wandering. So God sent his son with a map. He sends his son with a map and a plan called redemption to save us and bring us back to the glorious light. Our scripture today is based on Luke chapter 15, verses 1 to 10. Thank you so much for bearing with me through my introduction, which was rather long. But this week's message may be challenging because I will be sharing with you on the subject of the Christian's responsibility in reaching the lost with love. Because when we talk about Christmas, if you expected me to come here and preach a message on the three wise men or the shepherds, I'm sorry, that's not what the Advent is. That's not what the Christmas message is. The Christmas message is he came down because he loved us. 
The Christmas message is you were lost and I was lost. Just picture this in your mind while I'm preaching this message. Just picture this in, our, in your mind. We, I'm talking about Ashish. I'm talking about Sonia. I'm talking about each one of us in this place, right? We imagine us on this journey. This, we're sojourners. We're, we're on this journey just traveling and traveling and traveling. And out of nowhere, our Google Maps just fails on us. All right? You're in the middle of nowhere. You don't have data. You don't have, uh, nobody uses maps anymore, like, like actual physical maps, but your Apple maps don't work. Your, your Google maps don't work. Your Waze doesn't work. Or wherever else app you have does not work. You're stuck in the middle of nowhere, not knowing where to go. And suddenly out of nowhere, this person comes and says, sir, I think you're lost. Do you need help? And imagine that person to be Jesus. A man that comes into your, your utter lostness and he looks at you and he says, dude, I, I know you're heading somewhere, but it looks like you're clueless. That's a lot of us. We know we're going somewhere. We know we're heading somewhere. We know that there is purpose in life, but sometimes we're lost. We don't know where we're going. We don't know how we're going to get there. The things that we are holding on to have failed us. Money has failed us. A job has failed us. And you're confused and you're like, I don't know where to go. And man, you're so relieved when you see somebody coming up to you and you're like, oh, okay, can I get help? And he's like, yeah, I'm here to help you. And that GPS looks at you and says, I will guide you through the process. So Jesus, look at this and say, he, here is God sending his son with a map in his hand. And this map is called redemption for everyone that's lost. This map is a map that looks at you and says, you were once lost, but today I'm going to bring you back into the fold. I'm going to bring you back into the glorious light. Once you were out to discover, but man, you got lost that's why I said this week's message is challenging. I will go over this passage verse by verse, but I want to give you an overview of these parables that we're going to talk about in general. Uh, I actually taught about this vaguely back when I was, uh, we were meeting back in the house and when we were doing some, uh, uh, some of our weekly meetings, uh, we kind of had to go over certain uh, uh, certain of our, um, our core values, and we would go over each one of our core, and one of our core values in our church is love and compassion, and I'd mentioned a few of these points, so this might sound redundant to a couple of you guys over here, but I want us to understand this because this is what our church is all about, and these parables tell us one thing, that valuable things will be found. Remember something that is you and I as the body of Christ, the very reason as to why Jesus would come to search and find the lost, aka you and me, is because there is something of value in you and me. You would never seek for something that is not lost, that is not valuable. This is me, right? It's not that I don't value money. Right? If I have, so this has happened to me in the past. I, if I have a, a few change, I, I'm, I'm leaving the supermarket and I have, uh, say for example, I'm in Kroger and I'm, I'm leaving Kroger and I have some bags in my hand and I have a few coins that are, that are changed that came out of me, came to me. And then I have that, I'm holding that in my hand. I'm walking out of the store and I have a few cents that pennies that fall out of my hand. Right? And I have all these bags and I see this penny rolling down the street. Do you think that I'm going to leave all my bags and run after that one penny? What would you say? Would I or would I not? Take a moment and think about it. I will. Renny says I will, okay? Think about it for a second. Will I let go of all my bags in the middle of the street and run after that one penny? Now think about what that one penny represents, right? And, I, and, and, and how much we earn and all that stuff and how much that is in comparison to all the stuff that I'm just going to leave. and run. I, I probably won't. That's just me. I'm not going to leave you wondering if I will or not. I'm not that, you know, I'm not going to put myself on a pedestal and say, oh, I value that one penny. No. 
It's a penny, and, and you might be like, oh, that's money, Brother Oshers. How could you dare not go after that one penny? We're going to talk about that in a second. But it has nothing to do with what I'm going to talk about. But think about it for a second. That one thing, as compared to how much time I'm going to lose over one cent, is not worth my time. So what I will say is let it go. Remember that he only seeks that which is valuable. And the reason that he seeks you and me out is because you and I are a valuable piece of this bride that he is waiting to come and marry. And in these parables, in the story of the lost sheep or the lost coin, something of monetary value is something that these guys are after. Nobody, including the religious leaders who valued material things, would ignore such a loss. Rather, they would put every effort into finding it, and they would rejoice when they did. And if that is true about the material things, I'm asking you all, how much more true and important is that to the people that are lost around us? People that do not know Jesus. People that don't know what it is to have a relationship with Jesus. How much more important is, important is it for us as Christians and believers and as a church to come together and show them what that Jesus is all about? Because here's the thing, we're all about preaching. We're all about, you know, doing all the christian things. But when it comes to action, a lot of us falter. The term lost refers to those who are not in the faith or not fully in the faith to those who are outside the household of God, but whom God desires to come home to. And today I'm talking to each one of us about that category of people. Shouldn't we respond to people who are lost in the same way or even greater way than we would to lost things? Shouldn't we exhibit the same efforts and perseverance in searching for them? And today, that's my encouragement to all of us. I want to read that passage real quick. Verse 1 and verse 2. Luke chapter 15, verse 1 and verse 2. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus, but the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Very simple two verses, but the profundity of these verses that we have to gauge and understand from diving into what this actually means is pretty profound in how Jesus approached the situation. The first way that you reach the lost and the way that Jesus, this was his strategy of evangelism. If you're asking me how are we going to reach the lost and how is, how are we going to prepare the bride of Christ, it's, it's, the first thing is this, it's through compassion. For Jesus, he had the tax collectors and sinners gathering around him. Now I want you to pay very close attention to this, guys. Because this is powerful. You know, that's what the Bible says in verse number one. Now, the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus, but the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered. And that's pretty profound. You know why? These are the lost people, but they were not running from Jesus, but they were rather running to Jesus. That's amazing to me. They were not avoiding him. They were not ignoring him, not even hostile towards him. They were running toward, the Bible says in verse one, they were gathering around to hear him. Why were the sinners so willing and even eager to listen to Jesus? It was certainly not because, you know, he had an easy message that tickled people's ears and made them feel good. It wasn't because Jesus looked at them and gave them the prosperity gospel weekend after weekend. It wasn't because he made them feel elevated and he talked about their best life till now. No, 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 that's not why they thronged around Jesus. It wasn't because Jesus compromised on sin and said that everything they were doing was acceptable. No, that's not why they came around. They weren't gathering around Jesus because he was putting on some sensationalistic show of signs and wonders. Because at this point, Jesus, in Luke's narrative, the emphasis on Jesus' teaching and miracles are hardly even mentioned at this point. 
You got to understand that. It was not because of the miracles. It was not because it, there were signs and wonders all over. Then why did the law seek out Jesus rather than run from him? Because there's this tendency that people that don't know something, they, are, they, are, they, they go away from that thing instead of being drawn. But why was he drawn? Why were they drawn to Jesus? And I believe the answer is in this one word, compassion. Because Jesus loved them and showed that love with compassion instead of condemning them. They might not have dressed like him. They might not have had the same attitude that he had. They might not have had the same lifestyle that he had. They might not have had the same meals that he had. But as far as Jesus was concerned, that was the people that God sent him to. Commission Church, these are the people that God has sent us to in your jobs, in your workplaces, in your businesses, in your schools, wherever God has placed you. There are people that don't look like you and then don't believe what you believe and that's perfectly okay because that is why God has sent you there in the first place. That was Jesus' mission on the earth. The Bible says in verse two that Jesus welcomes sinners and eats with them. You know what the word welcomes mean? Welcomes means in this verse, it means receive as a friend. And who was he receiving as a friend? People that were what? Sinners. This was Jesus' attitude towards those who were lost in sin. You wonder why God pursues you and me? It's because of this one thing that no matter how sinful we are in our heart, God still finds it in his mercy to keep pursuing you and me. Jesus welcomes them. He was compassionate and accepting of them despite of their sins, despite of their faults. He was a friend and not a foe. Jesus had this attitude to lost people that, that lost people were just attracted to him. And my question to you and to me is do you and I have an attitude of compassion? compassion because the only way we can show love to the lost world is that we can show compassion and love to them that is unmatched. They don't need another person criticizing them. They don't need another person ostracizing them. They don't need another person putting them down. God has created us as a church to be, pe to, to be people and Christians that love on other people unconditionally no matter their race, their culture, the color of their skin, the language that they speak, their creed or their background, all that is immaterial to God because as far as God is concerned, he looks at their heart and he says, they are lost. It is your job and my job to go find them. It's an absolute human certainty that no one can know his own beauty or perceive a sense of his own worth until it has been reflected back to him in the mirror of another loving, caring human being. I remember once preaching at a meeting, it was a long time ago, I don't even remember where it was, but I still remember that day where I was preaching at a meeting and, and God told me, there's this, there's this voice that told me, there's this man that's standing at the back, I just want you to go and put your arm around him and just say hi to him. And that's what I did, I went, put my arm around him after the meeting, said hi to him and I said, hey man, I'm so glad to see you here. Shook hands with him and I said, you have no idea how glad, I don't even know his name. But I was prompted my spirit to do that. I build this conversation up with him and within five minutes, I come to realize that this man was, he was incarcerated. He was, he was in prison for a, for a long time, for around, if I'm, I don't know the number for sure, so I'm not going to make a number up. But for a long time, I'm, I'm going to say 10 to 15 years, he was there a long time and he said, man, I, I have never felt the touch of another human being or the love of another human being through touch. And this was the first time in 15 years that someone touched me affectionately and not pushed me around because I was an inmate in a prison. He said, in 15 years, this was the first time somebody stretched their arm and touched me in an affectionate way and wondered how I was or asked me how I was doing. The first time in 15 years, that man, in 10 minutes, I was able to share the gospel message with him and he gave his life to Jesus. You know why? Because for him, the gospel meant 
somebody looking at him and saying, you matter. There are people who will walk into this church and have never ever felt love and kindness and self-worth. They are searching for it in different places and unless you and I can show it to them through the love that Jesus has for them, That's what Jesus is asking us to do. Can you please look at everybody you encounter? And I'm just not talking about commission church, guys. I'm not just not talking about the people that come into church. I'm I'm talking about you being there on Sunday and Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday when you are in Walmart and when you see somebody next to you smiling at them, showing them the love, your everyday conversations with people, the people that you interact with, are they seeing Jesus in you? Will somebody look at your life and say, man, there's something good about that person. Let's do not be Sunday Christians. Let us be people that love on other people. Why? Because God loves them first. We must learn to regard people less in the light of what they do or they omit to do and more in the light of what they suffer, more in the light of what they're going through in their lives. Man, there are people over here that are going through so much in your lives and I probably don't even know about it because all I can see is your smiling face, but there's stuff that people are are, are battling with that you have no idea, but today all you can do is show them love and that can transform a person's life. Jesus showed compassion and changed lives by transforming them and introducing them to his father. The best way to change someone or to love on someone, uh, forgive me for saying change someone, but the best way to love someone is not try to change them, but instead show them the one that changed you. That's what we do in our relationships. We're always trying to change people around us. Wives are constantly trying to change husbands. Not my wife, she's, she's amazing. She, she gave me this smirk. My wife is amazing. She accepts me for who I am. Wives are constantly trying to change their husbands and husbands are constantly trying to change their wives. And, uh, and, 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 and you know, we're, we're, we're constantly trying to change the people that work with us and praying for them and asking God to intervene in their lives and casting the devil out of them sometimes. But man, sometimes you just got to show them the person that changed your life and they should be in awe and they should be like, wow, I want a piece of that. For us as individuals and as a church to reach out to people, we're going to have to show and have that same love and acceptance that Jesus had. Jesus was not hesitant to sit amongst the people that people looked down on. And Jesus was like, it's okay, because you know what? I'm here for a little bit, and and, and this life is a fleeting memory. And if you want to ostracize me for loving on somebody, go right ahead. But that's not going to stop me from loving like my father loves. He loved the world, not the church. He says, he loved the world so much that he gave. The first advent was because he loved. The last advent is going to be because he loves. And in the time being between the first advent and the last advent, we have one job. And you know what that one job is? To love. Not to preach. I can do all of this screaming. I can shout on top of my lungs. But if I fail to love, Isn't that what Paul reminds us in 1 Corinthians 13? Man, you can speak in tongues and you you, you can do all of this stuff, jump up and down. You can worship. You can put out CDs and write sermons and write books and preach. You could be the most popular preacher and you could be the most popular person in your school and all of that stuff. But if you can't love, whew, So the first thing needed for reaching the lost is compassion. And this is what I want to tell you today. Are you a person that identifies with compassion? And I draw this message to a close in the next 10 minutes. I want you to listen closely as we pray and close. But I I used this illustration not too long ago. But I know each one of us have probably drove past the scene of an accident, right? At some point in our lives. Some have, uh, some have probably been hurt in one before. You've probably been in an accident before. And at the scene of an accident, uh, there are three groups of people that are always at the scene of an accident. Each one of those three different groups of people have a different response to the accident. The first group is the bystanders and the onlookers. 
or the ones that just drive by and hold up traffic for no reason. Just to look and say, oh man, that's so bad. Or, oh, I feel so bad for that person. I hope that person's okay. They're just curious to watch and see what happens, but have little or no involvement. The second group is the cops, the police officers that arrive on scene real quick. They investigate. They're the ones that are there to, to see who caused the accident. They're the ones that are tasked with the responsibility of assigning blame, to give out appropriate warnings, to give out punishments, tickets, so on and so forth. Correct? And then there's a third category that they're the paramedics. They're also a, pe- a group of people that get there almost immediately. They are the people usually that are most welcomed by those involved in any accident. They could care less whose fault the accident was. They did not engage in lecturing them about good or bad driving habits. They were not issuing tickets. They were not saying, oh, I'm so sorry that you're going through this. They did not pray. They did not stand there and say, oh, I hope you're doing okay. No, no, no. They were there. Their response were to help those who are hurting. They were there to bandage the wounds, free trap people, give words of encouragement, There are three groups, one is uninvolved, one is assigning blame, assessing punishment, and the other one is helping the ones that are hurting. And my question to you is, which group are you in? When it comes to reaching the lost and hurting, we're gonna be in one of these three groups. We're probably uninvolved and we let others do all the work. We're like, oh, that's the pastor's job. That's the evangelistic team's job. I just come listen on a Sunday morning and go back. Or are we those people that will condemn people for their foolish behavior saying, oh, it's your own fault that you're in this mess. I told you so. If you had been going to church and doing like you should have, this would have never happened. You know those people. Or are we concentrating on helping those who are lost and hurting because I hope we will be one of those who are showing compassion like those in the last group. Today, sadly, many people in the church are responding like bystanders and like police officers who are giving blame and putting blame rather than standing and saying, I'm here to help. I'm here to bandage your wounds. I'm here to love on you. I said the first thing that we need is compassion. The second thing that we need to reach the lost is intentional living. Verse 3 and verse 4, the Bible says this, then Jesus told the parable, uh, suppose one of them had a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the 99 in the open country and go after the sheep that he lost until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders. Here's a, here's, a cat, here's a phrase I want to leave with you. Action is what converts our church's vision into significance. Action is what converts a Christian's words into things that matter. All that you say and believe in and read in the Bible are just hearsay unless you and I can take that and act on it every single day of your lives. Here's the point. It took intentionality and effort to find the lost items and it will take the same kind of diligent seeking for us to reach the lost. And these two parables, Jesus emphasizes the effort that went into actually seeking and finding the lost. And in the parable of the lost sheep, Jesus said that the shepherd leaves the 99. It's not like me who says, oh, I have a bunch of groceries in my hand or I have a a lot of change in my hand. I have the quarters still. I have the, 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 the notes in my hand still. It's just a penny. No, 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 no. Jesus basically says, I will leave the 99 in the open country and I will go after the lost sheep. In the parable of the lost coin, when you go down and read, the woman lights a lamp. She sweeps the entire house and she searches for this coin that she has lost. And in both cases, they sought after it with great intentionality. 
The shepherd did not wait for the lost sheep to wander home or the woman did not wait for the lost coin to turn up. In our Christian lives and in church, it sometimes seems like we do the opposite. We tend to wait till the lost come to us. We, we are passive rather than active, but God looks at us and says, man, I want you to reach out and love the unloved, love the unreachable, love the ignored, because that is what Jesus did in his mission on earth. You want to know what the advent is? You know what Christmas is? He came for the ignored. He came for the sinner. He came for the lost. If you're not going all the way, why go at all? Go big or go home. If you and I have to look at preparing the bride for Christ, you better understand you're not the only one that comprises the bride of Christ. It's a lot of people around us that are still to know the love of Jesus Christ. This is what I want to leave you with. How do we practically practice, practically practice this principle? What do you and I need to do in order to follow Jesus' instructions about giving every effort to reach the lost? First, pray. We have to pray for the lost. Secondly, we have to make every effort that, that we can to make a significant part of what we do as a church and our ministry as a church to be directed towards the lost. The PISD, Plano Independent School District, emailed me last week and they said, uh, Pastor Oshish, I'm so sorry, but March the I don't know, remember the first weekend of March, the Sunday, I think it's the 6th if I'm not wrong, they looked at me and said, unfortunately, you're not going to be able to use the school. And I was like, what? But on a Sunday, we have church. I didn't, I didn't tell them that, but my first reaction to that was, what are we going to do? I was freaking out. And God looked at me and said, Ashish, what is your church about? And I said, uh, reaching out. And he said, that's what I want you to do on that day. And I said, God, you don't want me to have church on a Sunday morning? And he said, nope. I said, what? I said, but my mom tells me that's a sin. And God looked at me and said, what is your mission? And I said, reaching the lost, reaching the hurting, reaching the needy. He said, put it into action. I said, God, you want me to cancel church on that day? He said, yep. I said, God, you just want us to sit home and just pray for the lost? He said, nope. I said, God, what do you want me to do? And he said, I want you to go out and I want you to serve. On a Sunday morning, on the Sabbath, God? And he said, yep. He said, I want you to take your team. I want you to take your church. And I want to see if you actually do what you say you're going to do. So you know what? That first Sunday of March, we as a church are going to go serve our neighborhood. We're going to go to the city of Plano, and we're going to go to the city of Richardson, and we're going to go to the city and ask them for homes uh, that, that, have been, that, that have been issued tickets, that have, been, uh, that, you know, that have not been kept well, and it might be single mothers or the elderly that have not been able to go out and attend to their yards or fences or whatnot. But you know what? We're going to work with the cities, or we're going to seek places that we as a church can go and impact our community. And that's what we're going to do. We're going to take church to our community. And some of you might be offended by that. But that's okay. Because for us, God is looking at us and saying, I want you to put your, you know what that's what that saying. I want you to put your what? Your foot where your mouth is? Or mouth where your foot is? But you know what? God's looking at us and saying, stop talking about it. Be intentional. Be intentional. So I'm closing today. The third and final point that I want to leave with you is this. As we make outreach a part of our personal and church spending, right? We've been improving in this, this aspect, the, the aspect that I just said about, I talked about. But the third point I want to leave, you, leave with you is this. The third thing that, that we need to reach out of the lost is persistent. Persistence. In Luke chapter 15, verses 4 and verse 8, the Bible says this. Suppose one of you have a hundred sheep and loses one of them. 
Doesn't he leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? Or verse 8, or suppose a woman has 10 silver coins and loses one. Does she not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? Persistence is so important, guys. David says this in Psalms 139, verses 1 to 4. Oh, Lord, you have examined my heart and you know everything about me. You know when I sit down or stand up. You know my thoughts and when I'm far away. You see me when I travel and when I rest at home. You know everything I do. You know what I'm going to say even before I say it, Lord. You know what David is talking about? David is talking about the hound of heaven. This, this, this God that keeps pursuing you and me. Remember, the advent is just not about God sending his son, but that son went on that cross. It didn't stop there. Advent is not just that Jesus died on the cross and once he died on the cross, he was like, I'm done, my, my job is over. Advent is also him looking at you and me and saying, man, I pursue you every single day. When David says, man, I can't escape from your presence, Lord. It's basically saying, I'm with you everywhere you go. You know what persistence is? That no matter what you do, I'm always going to be by your side. That's the promise of God. If he is so persistent about us. The third thing that we need to reach the loss is persistence. It's not usually the case there in our first, when we make first efforts to meet the loss, man, success might not meet us. Sometimes it takes years and years of persistence, but we should not be discouraged or give up. If a sheep or a coin was valuable enough to persistently search for, then people who are spiritually lost are too valuable to give up on. You and I are mandated to go after them till they find Jesus. Would you stand up with you, to your feet with me this morning? The religious leaders of the day had been indifferent towards the lost and even antagonistic towards them even coming to Jesus. They didn't want them doing, having anything to do with Jesus. Here's the thing, while I have no problem with the church adapting to the culture, Here's the thing, I, I want to make sure that we remain painstakingly true to the gospel of Jesus Christ and that we remain obedient servants to his truths. And sometimes it involves waiting and being persistent. John Maxwell says this beautiful thing. He says, learn to say no to the good so that you can say yes, yes to the best. Jesus uses these two parables to illustrate how wrong their response was, the Sadducees and the Pharisees and everyone that was putting blame, especially when compared to how they would have responded towards recovering something of far less value. And Jesus pointed out that and he said, man, these things matter to God. They matter so much to God that the Bible says when a lost person is found, heaven rejoices. The angels are rejoicing. That's what the Bible says. The first thing that is needed to reach out of the lost is compassion. The second thing is effort. Is intentionality. And the third thing is persistence. So I pray in close today, I want to give you the opportunity to, man, ask God to be your guiding light today. As a church, we pray. As a church, we believe in prayer. And today, as I conclude this message, I want to take this moment to pray. If our prayer partners can come up, and if there's anybody that needs to pray, they're available to pray for you guys. If, if you want to come and ask them for prayers, they're available in the front.